Welcome to Business Incorporated. I am BC at Dubai. Well, the markets are closed today to mark the Good Friday holiday. But let's review yesterday's numbers starting from here in Nigeria, where the bulls had the upper hand as more bag and hunting activities boosted equities total value by 150.82 billion naira. Now the main index appreciated further by 1.47 percent in South Africa. The GSC index ended the session up 2.83 percent. Egypt's blue chip index increased 2.24% on Thursday, while the Kenyan burst ended the week up 0.08%. And in the Middle East, shares in the United Arab Emirates registered their biggest weekly percentage gains in years as OPEC and its allies known as OPEC Plus on Thursday agreed to historic production cuts. The Abu Dhabi index climbed 6.38%, bringing weekly gains to more than 9%, and the most in percentage terms since December 2009. Dubai's main share index advanced 3.56%, snapping six straight weeks of losses. This week, the index settled up over 6%, posting its biggest weekly gain since February 2016. Saudi Arabia's stock market also edged up 0.1%, with Saudi electricity company rising 3.6%. Meanwhile, the kingdom said it will convene a virtual meeting of energy ministers from the group of 20 major economies today to foster global dialogue and cooperation to ensure stable energy markets and enable a stronger global economy. The Qatari index, however, slipped 0.45%, and that was hurt by a 6.4% fall in Misaid Petrochemical. And in Europe, the markets closed higher on Thursday as investors digested the latest U.S. jobless data and a $2.3 trillion stimulus package from the Federal Reserve. The pan-European stock 600 closed up by 1.4% provisionally, with travel and leisure stocks jumping over 4%, leading gains as all sectors traded in positive territory. And in the U.K., the FTSE 100 logged its biggest week since early 2009 on the further stimulus from the U.S. Federal Reserve and expectations among that the coronavirus crisis could soon ease. The blue chip index rose 2.9 percent on Thursday, ending a holiday shortened week with a gain of nearly 8 percent. The FTSE mid-250 index, which has underperformed the blue chip and small cap companies since the route started in February, added 3.4 percent, posting its best weekly performance. And stocks in Asia were mixed on Friday as most of the major markets across the region closed for the Good Friday holiday. Mainland Chinese shares were lower with the Shanghai Composite down 1.04% and the Shenzhen Composite dropped 1.946% to approximately 1,721.22%. The Shenzhen component fell 1.57% to 10,298.71. Japan's Nikkei 225 rose 0.79% to close at 19,498.5. And the Topics Index dipped 0.92% and in its trading day at 1,430.04. South Korea's KOSPI added 1.33%. The markets in Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore and India were all closed for the Good Friday holiday. And just like the others, the markets in the U.S. are closed due to the Good Friday holiday. But on Thursday, the S&P 500 gained 1.5% to close at 2,789.82, while the Dow Jones Industrial Average advanced 1.2% to 23,719.37. The Nasdaq Composite closed 0.8% higher at 8,153.58. For the week, the S&P 500 surged 12.1%, and that was its biggest one-week gain since 1974, when it rallied more than 14%. The Nasdaq had its best week since 2009, jumping 10.6%. The Dow soared more than 12% for one of its biggest weekly gains on record. Away from the stock markets now, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and Allied Nations have agreed to cut oil production by 10 million barrels per day. Now, a statement released by OPEC following the meeting on Thursday explains that the initial 10 million barrels per day cut would last from May to June before tapering to 8 million barrels for the rest of the year. 
That statement adds that cuts will decrease to 6 million barrels per day beginning from January 2021, which will continue through April 2022. But all members except Mexico have accepted the declaration. And as a result, OPEC says the agreement is conditional on the consent of Mexico. Mexico's Secretary of Energy said in a tweet that the country will be willing to cut production by 100,000 barrels per day for the next two months against the request of OPEC Plus for a cut of 400,000 barrels. Now back home here in Nigeria, residents of Lagos and Ogu State as well as the FCT in Abuja have had to work from home due to the lockdown ordered by President Mohamed Buhari to curb the spread of COVID-19. But many believe that this has exposed uh, the divisions between the digitally connected and the digitally excluded as most transactions now have to be done online. Well, I'm being joined by the founder and chief narrative officer of Clio's Advisory UK, Mr. Ted Judd, to talk about the implications of this on the Nigerian workforce digital economy. Good afternoon and thanks for coming on the program. Well, let's begin this conversation with you telling us how bad is the digital exclusion in Africa and particularly Nigeria? Well, there has been a huge increase in digital inclusion over the last 20 years. And in fact, in the last five, it's nearly all come from mobile phones and mobile banking. And if you look in the case of Nigeria, you've got nearly 90 percent of the population with a mobile phone. And of course, if you look at uh, the cities, it's more it's over 100 percent. Several people have multiple SIM cards. The trouble is, it's all about your ability to get banking and services on that. And when it comes to Internet, only around 40 percent of uh, Nigerians have access to the Internet. Internet, and nearly all of that is in the cities. And remember, it's not particularly affordable. To download 1G of data is quite a lot. Um, it costs quite a lot in terms of money in Nigeria. You compare that to South Africa, it's more like 60%. So when the coronavirus uh, in, imposes these constraints on everyone and they try and reach for the digital services, just how digitally connected is what has a really big effect on how it will impact on you and your life. Now, talking about the gig workers here in Nigeria now, how would this, how, how would they cope with the lockdown, especially if it has to be extended? Well, I think it's really showing the division between different kinds of jobs. If you take uh, professionals, it could be lawyers or bankers, uh, um, consultants. A lot of them are used to working from a hotel lobby, sitting in a, in a hotel room. So for them, even though their business might have been affected, they can deal with it digitally pretty easily. But if you are someone who is a Boda Boda driver, a Keke driver, who is already reeling from the fact that they've banned this vehicle from certain parts of Lagos, suddenly, you know, your customers disappeared, uh, you're in big trouble. On top of that, if you're someone like a cleaning lady, a plumber, a handyman, you can't work from home. Uh, and so I think really this is where we're going to see the divide, the digital divide, if you like. Those who actually are able to adapt quite easily because of their kind of job. But for the millions of people, uh, if you think of all the people who sell on the streets, you know, in Lagos, many times I've seen them going through the cars, which is stationary. Uh, you know, if they're not allowed to do that, and there are many, many fewer cars, a lot of people really will have lost their livelihoods overnight. Now, but who are the winners and the losers this period? As not everybody can actually work from home. No, exactly. But I think, look, there can be uh, winners, and they are the ones who have the digital connections and can adapt. If you think there are a lot of people who are market traders, they are no longer allowed to go into markets which are very densely packed, but they're using WhatsApp groups to make sales. They very often put their products online as their picture. Um, and then people who used to work as, uh, you know, uh, Uber taxi drivers or, or um, uh, motorcycle drivers are now delivering goods or are now delivering medicines instead of people. So if there are people who can have that digital connection, they can do so. And the entrepreneurial spirit is very strong in Nigeria. Oh, but what about those who are digitally excluded now? Who will be the worst hit to the spirit? I think really, I mean, it, it's two things. One is the rural communities where there are, is not very good coverage or where it's very expensive to get coverage for the internet. Um, you know, they could be cut off from any of the kind of digital services on offer now, particularly digital payments, because, you know, very often rural communities run out of cash. So digital payments can get around that. But at the same time, rural communities generally have very strong cultural connections between everyone. There is a sense of resilience and community there on massive crises, and they find incredible ways to get through it. Where I think the real worry is for the informal settlements, the slums, if you like, the big cities. Because the fact is you have people very dense 
And many of these people just don't know each other. Some of them have only been there for a very short time. So the idea of people trying to cram into the buildings which are not designed to take loads of people at the same time and not allowed to attend, that is going to be the hardest hit. And this is where the, the help has been uh, focused. But what can be done to address this digital divide? Well, I think the key thing is to try and get as many more people uh, connected digitally as possible. And this means, uh, you know, trying to find new uh, options. So uh, I've seen a lot of different uh, campaigns out there to try and address it in different ways. Uh, uh, UNESCO and uh, Innovation for Policy have a program which is basically to stop viral or negative information going out in the press, which is incorrect, and to see people are pro uh, properly informed. It's called hashtag don't go viral. And if people are properly informed, you can greatly reduce the spread of uh, the disease. But we've also seen, for example, um, uh, a lot of uh, mobile phone companies have been cut the cost of making certain payments. I know it can, for example, any payment less than $10 is free. That means effectively we have free digital banking for years. And so I've seen in Nigeria there are systems produced people banking together like they did during the Ebola crisis. Uh, approaches out there, really all are trying to link people together through the mobile phone. Well, what is your assessment of the innovations that we've seen so far being deployed to fight the COVID-19 crisis? Well, I certainly think, um, that, you know, the information campaigns that we're, we've seen, such as the Don't Go Viral, I think is very effective. But also, I, I'm actually experimenting with something that was done during the Ebola um, outbreak, which is um, looking at all data records, or CDR. One of the ways to track an outbreak is to actually track the calls as they come into an emergency helpline. And you, you can do that live. You can suddenly see, hold on, we've got seven or eight calls in the same area. You can immediately bombard the, everyone in the area of the tech saying, there's an outbreak in your area, do the following things. You can immediately trace the people and immediately start thinking about the other people you are with. You can even, if people have got GPS on their phones, literally track they been with, follow that up. And if, as in the case of Ebola, uh, people are very, very fast in big numbers to actually chase these up, you can prevent substantially the, uh, the spread of the virus. So this is something that they're working on at the but do you see Nigeria actually well prepared to manage this crisis? Well, I think if we look at the experience of Ebola, I don't think um, Nigeria has ever been given enough credit for what it achieved back in 2015. Um, when Patrick Sawyer, the, the uh, infected lawyer, went into Nigeria, he was deliberately tended to spread uh, Ebola, and he did a lot of things to really try and out and spread it. And the people who stood in his way, a lot of them, a the number of them tragically died. But the way that the government prevented a massive outbreak. Um, in the end, there are only 19 confirmed cases. Mr. Ted Judge, uh, who's the chief uh, founder and chief narrative officer of Clears Advisory UK, thanks for speaking with us on the programme. When we return in just a moment, we'll take a look at the impact of restrictions on commercial and international travels on Nigeria's tourism sector. Do you stay with us? <laughs> 